In theory, phones are supposed to be more secure than computers. There are many more built-in protections in Android and iOS than the typical computer. Supposedly. Remember when Jeff Bezos' iPhone was hacked? Now suddenly we have thousands of cases where the newly discovered Pegasus malware was used to hack phones of important people, like journalists, activists, and world leaders, mostly iPhones. Many of these were categorized as no-click attacks, meaning no user interaction, which is really scary. Since there's nothing factual to grab onto, I will engage in conjecture to see if certain entities, like state-sponsored organizations, may be attacking us via secret backdoors known only to them. Our phone backdoors likely. Stay tuned. I'm on the platform odyssey.com and now I'm one of the top creators on there. Just for insurance in case I get the platform, please follow me there using the link in the description. I have a VPN service, Bytes VPN. My company also sells the Google phones and VPN routers. These products are made to make your identity disappear on the internet. If you're interested in them, they are on my app Braxme. The link is in the description. Some of you have asked me about the recently published Pegasus attack. Pegasus is an intrusion package for phone spying and is made by the Israeli company, the NSO Group. You can read all the press reports about Pegasus, but the main drift is that someone got a hold of a list of 50,000 phone numbers that were being targeted by Pegasus, and it turns out that this target list was made up of activists, journalists, and many world leaders. The customers of the NSO group are agencies of nation states, and these nation states were provided with the Pegasus tool. Some of the phone attacks are categorized as no-click attacks. No click means no user interaction. They target your device and BAM! They're spying on your activities, phone calls, photos, files, text messages, and so on. In this instance, most of the non-click attacks were claimed to be on iOS devices. Though Pegasus was described as also able to target Android, it is not clear if this can be done with a no-click attack as well. This attack is particularly disturbing because security researchers have been studying operating systems like Android and have concluded that it is very safe. And these same researchers have come to me stating that iOS is even safer. Yet with the Jeff Bezos hack and this new Pegasus hack, the target was an iOS device. According to what I read so far, the premise stated is that the attacks used zero-day flaws on site apps on an iPhone like the photo app provided by Apple. However, I really have doubt if this is the complete story. I understand the security model of iOS and Android. Android, for example, is well insulated from getting root access to the device. All apps run inside a virtual machine. Each app permission is closely limited by security rules set by the SE Linux security module. The stuff is not 100%, but it's very good. It covers many known ways of attacking an Android. Android is also open source. The security parts of it are well documented, and in theory, there are no secrets, so attack entry points are closed up very quickly. In contrast, iOS is closed source. Users base their trust of its security on Apple's reputation and promises. Apple encrypts the phone storage and also limits the ability of an app to go beyond its sandbox area. There's a special security chip on the phone to ensure that the generated encryption key is hidden on that phone only. Generally speaking, regular hackers have a harder time hacking an iPhone, perhaps because of security by obscurity. And yet iOS got hacked. Curiously, most hacks on the iPhones are from state-level players. State-level players, meaning those with access to government resources, are a different animal. Frankly, I have no idea how to hack a phone with a no-click attack. Usually, a phone attack requires some sort of social engineering to get the user to click. But why is it that certain types of attacks appear to cluster in certain areas and solutions aren't published? For example, this Pegasus attack apparently originates from a no-click iMessage text. Let's talk about another similar phone attack from a couple of years ago. This was called the SimJacker attack. And the way this attack worked, a state player sent hidden text messages to the phone. And then the phone responded like a remote-controlled robot and could then turn on the phone, 
dial out, send and receive SMS messages, all without the user knowing. And once again, with no click. According to Adaptive Mobile Security who discovered this SimJacker attack, their research showed that this attack was being performed at the behest of a state player, likely a three-letter agency. Another similar attack from even further back, publicized several years ago, was the SS7 attack. In this approach, there's an out-of-band command and control channel used by the carrier that's separate from the voice and data, called SS7. And when that is intercepted in some way over the carrier's network, then phone text can be captured, voice calls spied on, and so on, similar to the SimJacker attack. The difference is that SS7 is controlled at the carrier side, not at the device level. The device just knows to follow instructions. Authorization for doing SS7 and getting access likely requires inside information or a god level security at the cell carrier, which of course a government can demand of a carrier. None of these attacks have any clear resolution, just like Pegasus, like they're buried under the carpet and no one says anything further. But again, all of these attacks are at the state player level and all seem to be tied to the carrier and they're all connected to SMS messaging in some way. Here's another instance that truly bugs me and no one mentions it, particularly politicians. The Harris Corporation has been making mobile phone spy devices that the government has been trying to hide for years. For a long time, law enforcement was using these devices without a warrant. The first model was called Stingray and it was able to intercept the 2G and 3G traffic from a phone. Many, many years later, Stingray has been unraveled by security researchers and you can basically copy what Stingray does on 2G and 3G. The Stingray attack is based on the device emulating a cell tower. The original attack was over 2G and 3G. 2G was unencrypted. And on 3G, the encryption could be turned off, thus allowing the intercept. Security researchers have figured out that the only way to attack LTE phones is by downgrading the service to 3G. However, Harris Corporation has released devices that can now break into LTE. 3G is not an option anymore on many networks in the USA. LTE is encrypted. So this is a particularly difficult challenge, yet they're able to do it. How? Let me tell you another disturbing fact. Aside from the Harris Corporation, there are YouTube videos about law enforcement conventions where other companies are selling similar products that do attacks on phones. And these capabilities are often used to spy on dissidents in many countries or perhaps opposition leaders and so on. How do these players get information to attack our phones? The Pegasus attack, by the way, has been analyzed only from a behavior called signaling. This means that although people don't know for sure how the phones got infected with the malware, the phones themselves are confirmed to be infected with Pegasus because the malware calls home to command and control servers. In the case of Pegasus, there was also the insider list of phone numbers supposedly hacked from a server at the NSO group. Amnesty International performed the research and contacted those phone numbers and then tested the phones they were able to collect. They then discovered the consistent signaling being done between the phone and certain websites. If this phone number list was never leaked, in theory, no one would have found out about Pegasus. And by extension of that logic, it is quite likely that many more attacks are out in the wild and the phones being spied on would be unknown. Now, if you've analyzed the common feature of all the attacks I mentioned here, they all seem to be tied to a phone number. And something I explained in other videos, a phone number is tied to a unique IMSI, International Mobile Subscriber Identity. In fact, the Stingray device is now generically called an IMSI catcher. Anyway, I will connect the similarity of these attacks in a moment. Most of you think of your mobile phone as a single device, but really it must be understood as being multiple devices in one package. There's the computer side of it, which is what most of us interact with when we are using the apps, the internet, and the user interface part of the phone. The second part of the phone is called the cell baseband modem. There are other parts of the phone that could raise suspicion. This is something you need to watch in my other video on hidden radios in IoT devices. This would relate to the Wi-Fi Bluetooth module, which is also responsible for GPS and Wi-Fi triangulation. This integrated chip is typically made by Broadcom, but I will skip that for this video. I consider this a potential future threat. 
So my main target issue for now is the cell baseband modem. First of all, the cell baseband modem has a lot of secrets. Its manufacture is extremely controlled by two major players in the cell baseband modem market, and that's Qualcomm and MediaTek. MediaTek is a Taiwan-based company. The reason they hold control of the baseband market is because of patents. Basically, these two companies own most of the patents. Generally speaking, from what I know, USA phones that deal with Verizon and Sprint require chips from Qualcomm. So basically, the USA phone market uses Qualcomm chips. If someone brings in a GSM phone for international use, I would assume that that would be using MediaTek chips. The point is, there are two secretive companies making chips for all the baseband modems in the world. The next interesting fact about these cell modem chips is that they are sold as SOCs, which means system on a chip. In case you've never heard of this lingo, it basically means it's a full computer on a chip. It runs its own operating system, probably some version of Linux. It controls its own hardware. It has a separate CPU. It's an independent computing device and it sits next to the Apple A14 or A whatever chip or ARM Snapdragon on Android. It is a side-by-side -side CPU. The iOS or Android OS really doesn't control what goes on in the Qualcomm chip. This is already proven by the hacking using the SimJacker attack. First, the cell baseband modem apparently can receive commands via SMS text, but the texts can be hidden meaning not seen by the operating system. Remember, all this is occurring via radio and iOS and Android rely on the baseband modem to tell it what's going on on the radio side. If the radio chooses to not let the operating system know what it's sending or receiving, then the OS is docked. The SimJacker attack also apparently gets instructions from the SIM card. So basically some part of the code for interpreting commands are in the SIM card itself. And clearly the baseband modem has some software that can interpret the commands in the SIM card. The SIM card receives data from the cell carrier via radio and that has to be tied to a cell subscription and the cell MZ identifier. Makes sense then that this attack requires a phone number. I'm going to presume then based on this information that the radio does not listen to the cell network if there's no SIM card. So that's an important takeaway in my opinion. The fact that the SimJacker attack, Pegasus, and SS7 attacks all use a phone number and texting tells me that the target is the cell baseband modem. Now, according to some researchers, the commands used in the SimJacker attack was based on some old programming instructions that are no longer used and left on the SIM card. Not sure if I can believe that. In case you didn't know, the largest SIM card manufacturer in the world is Jamalto. And they make billions of these and they didn't know that there was some hidden code in there. Yeah, right. And that's not to say this hidden code is even necessary. It could just be a high level interface. There could be a low level interface still available in the baseband modem directly. Now let me tell you something else interesting about the baseband modem. Apparently the baseband modem has a direct bus access to the full memory of the phone. Now security researchers have been told that the direct access to memory is limited between the baseband modem and the phone main CPU by some sort of security locking intermediary. Again, do we know the whole story? If someone on the inside at Qualcomm, Jamalta, Broadcom and so on have knowledge of how to access memory through some back door, you now have a potential way for the baseband modem to directly attack the main CPU of the phone to pass malware. Remember the memory is electrically wired together with the main CPU and the baseband modem SOC. The company Purism claimed they understood this potential risk and installed the baseband modem separately from the main phone in the Librem 5 phone that they are making. The interaction between the main CPU and the baseband is then solely through a USB connection, so no direct access of memory. The Pine phone did the same thing by connecting the modem only via USB. And in theory, you can make a Raspberry Pi phone also putting the baseband on USB. So the two new phones had the potential for limiting this baseband risk. Unfortunately, both phones, which are Linux phones, have not yet solved all the software issues and are still floundering today. Too bad because they might have been more immune to these types of attacks. 
I have the Pine phone and that's closer to being useful. I have not yet received the Librem 5 phone from Purism. My order is closing in on two and a half years ago. I really hope they succeed because these two Linux phones are the only products that can theoretically stop or limit a baseband modem attack. If you've been following the story, let's go back to the list of players. Did you notice that there are few? It seems like a company like Harris Corporation didn't have to go very far if they wanted to get secret access to create some new version of Stingray for 5G and authorized by the government. The short list, Qualcomm, MediaTek, Jamalto, and maybe include Broadcom if you want to hit the Wi-Fi Bluetooth chip. You can even skip MediaTek if you're focused only on the USA. Qualcomm, Broadcom are USA companies. Jamalta is based in the Netherlands. Jamalta likely makes most of the chips for most of our credit cards, so they are very reliant on the USA market. So basically, these few companies control the security of every single human with a phone. Is it theoretically possible that state-sponsored players like Harris Corporation, NSO, and others could have been given secret access to data which would have allowed them a backdoor to the baseband modem? If I recall, even Cisco inserted a backdoor to Cisco routers. They called it the Lawful Intercept Backdoor. And let's never forget the Intel IME, the backdoor to every Intel computer, supposedly for corporate use. It is not uncommon for programmers to put backdoors in their products. I have to admit that I have put backdoors in proprietary software I built in the past. So this is not a new concept to me. And for the older folks who have watched the movie War Game from the 80s, you will remember the backdoor in the Whopper. At this moment, there are just too many intersections of hacking issues with the cell baseband modem and all states sponsored, so it's beginning to quack like a duck. By the way, in the USA, there's a law called CALEA, Communications Assistant for Law Enforcement Act. Basically, carriers are required by law to allow call interception or wiretapping to be built into the network. Now, usually the wiretapping is done on equipment at the carrier's side, but someone could interpret the law as being required on the user device side as well. Is someone invoking this law to force a backdoor? Let me tell you some other interesting little quirks with baseband modems. Have you ever received a carrier update message on your iPhone? That is obviously some programming being sent to the phone. Is that data being recorded to the SIM card? The SIM card is carrier specific, so it would suggest that the target of the carrier software update is the SIM card. I don't really know. By the way, Android phones perform carrier updates quietly. They don't alert the user. I've learned in the past to be extremely wary of carrier updates. Someone told me that his phone gets a carrier update message when he drives by certain locations in Fort Meade, Maryland. Obviously, that's the location of a three-letter agency. I didn't experience it firsthand, but any carrier update specific to a certain location would be suspicious. Another interesting detail. As it turns out, I found some cryptic documentation on the internet that the cell baseband modem can be updated on the air, or OTA. So there were some specific instructions to the effect. Do you understand the implications of that? The idea of flash memory on SOCs is nothing new. Many devices come now with FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array. This is a specific standard on modifying code on a chip so a chip can be reprogrammed after manufacture in the field. Of course, only the insiders would know this to be a fact, but if an SOC contains a programmable flash memory, then it could be theoretically possible to change the behavior of a modem. And I already discussed that talking to a cell baseband modem can be done out of band using the cell radio independent of the OS. Now the late John McAfee himself discussed the issue just before he died, that it is virtually impossible to spot a backdoor inserted into hardware or software by a software engineer that is a foreign intelligence agent or even a domestic intelligence agent. This is something I've implied in my recent antivirus video. The cocky cybersecurity professional will assume he's covered because he's using the latest edge security modules from Sophos or Checkpoint. And the reality is that you may not be able to protect against a backdoor built into software or hardware, even software we commonly use. I personally am not cocky about this. 
I'm imagining what I could do as a software engineer and what I could hide, and McAfee is right, it would be impossible to spot. So clearly it is highly probable that a backdoor exists in cell phones and possibly available to state level players, likely highly protected information and used primarily against enemies of the state. Whether done by some planted software engineer or deliberately provided by a company, we would never know. John McAfee said he didn't use a cell phone. Although I recall when I talked to him that I saw some sort of phone, so I'm figuring he may have had a phone with no SIM card. Librem 5s or Pine phones have hardware switches that can turn off the cell baseband modem, plus they isolate the interface to USB. They would have been the best choices for this threat if they were ready for prime time. Alternatively, maybe having a side phone with no SIM card and just using Wi-Fi with an app like Signal might be useful. I want to make clear that the security threats that I'm exposing here are apparently state level capabilities. It is not likely a threat for the common person. To me, the average person's threats are more along privacy lines, meaning big tech would be the adversary. However, it is still disturbing that someone at will can just turn on a switch and choose to spy on any target phone. I hope you find my videos of value. If you do, please hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you get more of this content. You can support the cause by joining us on Patreon or checking out our VPN, VPN routers, and the Google phones in my store, Brax.me. Thank you for watching.